So for some full transparency, I have been putting off reading this book and filming this video for the past two weeks. I feel like I'm gonna cry already and I'm just setting up. So I was always planning on reading this book in the month of June. I, I just, it was always on the schedule. I just finished the book this morning and my head hurts from how hard I was crying. So anyway, I'm, let's just, let's just rip off the bandaid. Let's just get into this. Hello, my name is Kristen and that's not my intro. So let me start over. Hello, it's a new day, a new sleigh and a new video where I have something to say and I'm gonna try to say it without crying. That'll be a challenge. I, I just want to lay in my bed and rot. So I just want to remind everyone at the beginning of the video that during the entire month of June, by watching this video and watching through my ads, you will be actively helping me to donate to organizations such as Doctors Without Borders, Operation Olive Branch, the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund, and an option to donate to a charity of your choice. You can submit this charity in the poll on my community tab It'll be right about here. I'll put a little screenshot so you can go to it. And yeah, we're making a lot of progress so far, so I'm very excited. And I will tell everyone at the end of the month how much we raised and how much is going to which organization. So that'll be fun. Um, thank you for supporting the channel. Let's get into it. So the book I read is called They Both Die at the End by Adam Silvera. And to Adam Silvera, which I know you won't watch this video, but that's fine. Um, you are on my list. You're on it. Thank you, congratulations. If I find you, it is on site. Thank you for writing this book, but respectfully, how dare you? <laughs> as a spoiler-free summary, as spoiler-free as you can get with the title being the literal ending, this book follows two boys, that is Rufus Emeterio and Mateo Torres. In this fictional world, on the day that they are going to die, they will get a call from a company called Deathcast. Deathcast makes the calls between uh, midnight and like 3 a.m. and they will tell you that sometime in the next 24 hours, you are going to die. They won't tell you how and they won't tell you when. Rufus and Mateo are both 17 and 18 respectively. At the beginning of the book, they are strangers and yet they still get the same call on the same day. Rufus was recently orphaned after his two parents and his sister got the call from Deathcast and died four months earlier. And Mateo is currently alone because his father is in a coma and his mother died when he was born. So not wanting to spend their end day alone, they respectively decide to download the app called Last Friend. This app connects people with one person to befriend on the very last day of their life. So the book follows Rufus and Mateo as they spend their last day together and live their lives to the fullest before it ends. The five stages of grief are denial, anger, bargaining, uh, depression, and acceptance. Um, and I'm currently in denial. Thanks to denial, I'm immortal. It's a little hard for me to make this video because really, truly, I just want to crawl into a ball and cry my eyes out. Like, it's just, it's, it's like a book I almost don't even want to talk about because I'm just like, it's, I just, I can't, I can't, it's just so devastating. So this is definitely kind of leaning on like magical realism and magical realism is a specific genre of literature. Um, let me get a Google definition. Sometimes I just, why, why explain something when the internet can explain it so much better, you know? Magical realism or marvelous realism is a style or genre of fiction and art which presents a realistic view of the world while incorporating magical elements, often blurring the lines between fantasy and reality. So in this book, the magical aspect is Deathcast, this company that is able to call you and tell you what day you are going to die. And typically like the magical aspect is supposed to be kind of like how I said in my review of The White Guy Dies First, where it takes like a fear and magnifies it. It's kind of the same thing with magical realism. It'll take a specific theme or topic that it wants to address and magnify it by making it more magical or fantastical. So this book is an examination of a fascination, for lack of a better term, that we as humans seem to have with the concept of death. It is the one thing that is guaranteed in life, the one thing we know nothing about and yet know will happen no matter what. I mean, the topic of death is discussed so much in media, in books, TV shows, movies, everywhere you turn, someone is talking about death. And in this book, I think by having Deathcast as a company, it really examines the way that we as humans 
uh, cope with our own mortality. So even though the book centers on Mateo and Rufus, we also meet a few other characters that do get like mini chapters, especially throughout the second and third parts of the book. So Mateo Torres is kind of like a homebody. He's a little agoraphobic, if you will. He has just graduated high school. He signs up for online classes for university and he is just deathly afraid to be outside in the world. But he does have a desire for friendship and for human connection, although he's just too afraid to do it by himself. So at the beginning of the book, we start with Mateo as he gets his call from Deathcast. It takes a while for Mateo to really come to terms with it and decide that he wants to live his life to the fullest with the last day that he has on this earth. The only thing that he's able to decide is that he doesn't want to tell his only friend Lydia that he is going to die that day. In my grief, I have moved on from denial. I am now at anger. It's such a cosmic joke, the way that this book turns out, because... <laughs> oh my god, Adam Silvera, you're so hee hee ha ha baby girl funny. How dare you? Okay, let me get to it. So when Deathcast first calls Mateo, he kind of spirals and thinks about all the things he has yet to accomplish, the things he's never done in his life, and specifically the things that he was always afraid to do. And for a long time, he really spends the first few hours of his last day just doing things that he doesn't feel should be how he spends his last day. He starts cleaning his house, cleaning his room. He's really like ironically procrastinating doing the other things that he wants to accomplish on this last day, that being seeing his dad for the last time and talking to Lydia, his best friend for the first time. First time, last time, that's what I meant to say. And in, in the first part of the book, he keeps telling himself like, no, I have to live the rest of my life. I have to get out in the world. I have to do something. I can't just die alone in my apartment. I have to get out there. So that is when he initially decided Decides to create his account on Last Friend. And the first few interactions he has on Last Friend I think are really interesting to kind of analyze. I think again with the magical realism of this book it really examines the way that different people deal with death and their own mortality. In this instance Mateo has gotten the call. He knows a hundred percent with no doubt that he is going to die that day. So he is connecting with people with pure genuine intent of being with someone and making a connection that is meaningful on his end day. He first speaks with a girl that doesn't really seem interested in helping him at all and is really just kind of interested in losing her virginity. Then he speaks to another person that is making a joke and saying like, I have the key to immortality in my pants. So he is just having like, bad conversation after bad conversation. Someone is asking if he's selling a couch because it's his end day. And you really kind of see how almost sick it is. Almost. It is sick. It's really sick. But that's because the people he's talking to aren't Deckers. And Deckers are the people that have gotten the call from Deathcast and it's their end day. So these are people that know without a doubt that they will survive that day, that they are going to live another day, that they have at least one more tomorrow. So there is a distance between them and Mateo who is going to die that day. And it's really blunt, it's really in your face to show you that there are people like that. That's not the fictional part of it because there are people that are so distanced from the idea of death, so numb to it, that they act in that way as if, almost as if it's not real, as if it's not actually a person on the other line talking to them. Example, does everyone remember Miss Vanessa Hudgens during the pandemic saying, yeah, people are gonna die. Yeah, people are gonna die. It's just terrible, but like, inevitable. And her saying that to the faces of millions of people that had lost people during the pandemic that were facing death is insane. And I remember at the time she was facing so much backlash and people were so angry with her with reason, but it just goes to show that there are people like that that are so distanced from the idea of death and they think they're so untouchable that they say things like that, that they act like that. And whether or not it's good or bad is up to interpretation. It's up to everyone's individual ideas. But the reality is that is a human life that is not going to exist in 24 hours. Those are people that are dying. So yeah, it's, it's sick and it's twisted. And especially because as we're reading, we're in the perspective of someone that is dying. So it's even more sinister, but 
that's the reality of us living in our day to day. We might not have death casts. We might not know which day we're going to die or how much time we have left, but it doesn't make it any less sick for someone to say that in a fictional book versus to say that in the real world. Now, on the other hand, we have our second lead that is Rufus Emeterio. He, as I mentioned, is orphaned because his two parents and his sister died four months earlier after they all got their call from death cast. Since then, Rufus has been in a really dark place and he has made some bad decisions. So he gets the call as he is in the middle of beating up his ex-girlfriend's new boyfriend. And ever since getting that call, all he can think about is all of his regrets. All the things he's done that he wishes he hadn't, and now that he is faced with his own mortality, he just, that's all he can think about. So with Rufus and Mateo, we have two different perspectives. Someone regretting all the things they never did, and someone regretting the things they have done. So when they eventually find each other, it's because Rufus was having his funeral, mm -hmm, his funeral, with his friends from the foster home, which he calls the Plutos, including his ex-girlfriend, Amy, and she brought her boyfriend that Rufus beat up, and I'm sorry, I that made me so genuinely angry. I was like, why would you bring him? But that goes into a separate point that I'll get into later, but that the genuine anger I felt at that woman Oh my God, I support women's wrongs, but that, that was too wrong. That was sick, disgusting. And when this gets turned into a movie, the actual anger I will feel toward the actress, I, I will have to really restrain myself. Amy's new boyfriend, the person that Rufus beat up, his name is Peck. He calls the police on Rufus on the day he's literally going to die uh, to get him arrested. Because you know what's worse than dying? Knowing that you're going to die and then spending the last day on earth in a jail cell. So Rufus ends up fleeing the scene and he sees some graffiti on the wall advertising Last Friend. So he decides to download the app. Simultaneously, after Mateo has had all these bad encounters, he decides that, you know what? I have to keep trying. I can't just let these people, rather let all these bad encounters deter me from living the rest of my life the way I want to. And that is when they meet each other on Last Friend and decide that they will spend their end days together. So together, they, they really help each other out. Rufus helps Mateo realize his dreams, self-actualize, and become the person he always wanted to be. Mateo helps Rufus come to terms with his emotions and be open and vulnerable about them and embrace the things he likes to do, specifically photography. And one of the other things that I thought was really interested in this book is how it examines our connections and the ways that we affect the people around us without really knowing it. So as I mentioned earlier, throughout the book, we get a few different perspectives from a lot of different seemingly side characters. Honestly, when you start a chapter, it'll say like this random name you haven't heard before and you kind of start and you're like, who is this person? Or is this a new character? What What's going on? But then you realize that this is a person that has been touched by Rufus and Mateo, someone that is relevant to their story, even if they don't know it. For example, and this is not a spoiler, so don't get crazy. Again, the title of the book is a spoiler, so fight me. The reason Rufus downloaded Last Friend was because he saw some graffiti on a wall outside a gas station advertising Last Friend. The graffiti was done by this one person that is an avid advocate for the Last Friend app. So we get a chapter from this character, her name is Zoe Landon, and Deathcast has called her on the same day as Mateo and Rufus. She actually was one of the people that tried to reach out to Mateo with good intentions, but he was already matched up with Rufus, so he never responded to her. Instead, Zoe ends up pairing up with this other girl named Gabriella and Gabriella confesses to Zoe that she is the person that is tagging the city with advertisements for Last Friend. And she was the person that made the graffiti tag that Rufus saw and pushed him to download the Last Friend app. And then on top of that, Rufus and Mateo and Zoe and Gabriella cross paths as, as they're getting on and leaving the subway and Mateo leaves a blind date with a book on the seat of the subway car. Uh, Zoe picks it up and she gives it to Gabriella as her last gift to her last friend. And that 
is just one mini storyline of how Mateo and Rufus have left their mark on the world and how they have affected implicitly, again, without any intention, how they affected the people around them and simultaneously how other people have affected them. If Gabriella never went on the Last Friend app, she probably wouldn't have made any of those tags. If she didn't make any of those tags, Rufus would not have downloaded the app and Rufus and Mateo would have never crossed paths. So really, I think it's a great examination of the choices that we make, almost like a butterfly effect, that there are choices that we make that will affect other people. Whether or not it's for the good or for the bad is up to interpretation. For example, another uh, interesting timeline of connections. So Rufus tells Mateo that he's very interested in taking pictures. He likes photography. Rufus shows Mateo his Instagram account where he has a ton of pictures, but they're all in black and white. And Mateo offers an idea to Rufus that he should take pictures all throughout their end day, but post them on Instagram in color so that he can leave something to the Plutos, leave his lasting legacy on the world through his Instagram account. I'm actually gonna look it up. It probably exists. No, it exists. Son of a bitch, who did this? <sighs> Everyone's so creative. <laughs> so Rufus has this Instagram account and he is uploading pictures in color as he spends the last day with Mateo. As I mentioned previously, Rufus, before he got his phone call, was beating the living poop out of Peck, right? So Peck called the police at Rufus's funeral, but he managed to escape. Peck was really angry about it because obviously he got his butt kicked by Rufus. And he's especially mad because his new girlfriend is mad at him for doing that. He decides that he wants to get revenge on Rufus because it's not enough that it's his end day. He wants to be the reason it ends. What Rufus doesn't know is that he's been uploading pictures as they go throughout the entire city and specifically taking pictures of locations throughout the city in real time. Mateo didn't know that by telling Rufus to do this, he was uploading real-time locations of where they were at to a public account that Peck was able to view. Isn't that funny? Isn't that just a nice little cosmic joke? You know, I really could talk about death and just the different ways that all these characters approach their own mortality and this idea of dying. I think having Deathcast as a company as the magical realism aspect of this book is really interesting because as the reader it gives you perspective. What we understand as the reader based on the rules that are set out for us is that if Deathcast calls you, you are absolutely going to die that day. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Deathcast doesn't make mistakes, they don't call the wrong people, and they don't mispredict death. Nothing is going to stop you from dying that day if you get that call. And yet, we have characters like Mateo that is constantly trying to prolong or even avoid death. There's a long time where he spends in his apartment because he thinks that as long as he doesn't leave, then maybe he'll escape death. Maybe he is the exception. And he even says that there's multiple people on online forums that think that they can escape it. They think they are exceptional. They're the chosen one. And yet time and time again, we see that that's not true. At the beginning of the book, Mateo and Rufus don't even take the elevator. Mateo doesn't want to get on his bike. They wear helmets. They look both ways before crossing the street. They don't go when any cars are nearby. They do everything they can to avoid death. And as the reader, you're almost like, well, it's guaranteed you are going to die in some way or another. What is the point of prolonging it in this way? What is the point of going through these measures when you know that you can't escape what's going to happen? But then that's what happens in real life too. In the real world, there are people that do those things, that try to escape death in any way possible. And I think the idea of like prolonging or avoiding death really depends on your definition. Some people think that prolonging life means getting surgeries or uh, organ donations, even things like vaccines, that that is prolonging your life or trying to cheat death in some way. And then you have people on the opposite end of the spectrum 
them where they are risk takers. They'll do all this crazy stuff with an almost reckless abandon for their life because they want to quote unquote live life to the fullest. You have people that go skydiving. You have people that are tattooing their eyeballs, people that swim with sharks or people that just do inherently dangerous things for the thrill, for the rush with complete disregard for their own mortality or the actual danger of it. So in this book, it's very contained where we know with certainty that these characters are going to die that day. And yet when you apply that to the real world, you can see the, the similarities, the parallels that even though in our real life world we don't have death cast we don't know what day we're going to die we know that it'll happen and some people knowing that and fearing that will take certain measures to avoid it in any way they can and there are some people that will choose to embrace it and choose to live life to the fullest do these dangerous things all for the sake of living. And it's also interesting because in this book, they also talk about people that have terminal illnesses. And these are people that do know they're going to die. And we kind of see how they approach their life. This book is like a really, really interesting, really large uh, examination of death and the different forms that it takes on from person to person. It really is like a big butterfly effect. If you play any like butterfly effect games or things of that nature where your choices are set in stone and you follow a certain path based on those choices, it's a lot like reading this book. I will get into minor spoilers now. So if you want to avoid those, um, I'll include a timestamp. I don't know how deep I'm going to get into these spoilers, but we're going to start now. So there is a section in the book where we have point of views from this woman Delilah who has gotten a call from death cast although she thinks it's a prank because she recently broke off her engagement with someone that works at death cast named Victor who ironically was the person that called Rufus that same night Delilah thinks that he's playing a prank on her so she just decides to go on living she doesn't even bother to check the website to see if she's actually a decker so she spends her end day that she doesn't know is her end day trying to get an interview with Howie Maldonado a very famous actor that has been in the book adaptation movie series that takes place in this book series, funny enough. So she's going to a bookstore to purchase his one book that he did actually write. And at the same time, Rufus and Mateo are passing by and go into the exact same bookstore, which happens to be next to a boxing gym. And unknowingly, there is another Decker that is heading to that gym. He has spent his whole life trying to be a boxer, a fighter of some kind. And yet all that work is for nothing in his eyes because he slowly progresses with, he has some kind of muscle disease where he's getting very weak and soon enough he gets kicked off of his like boxing team. And now he has just gotten the call from death cast and he is angry and upset and he wants one last bang. So he decides to go down to the boiler room of his boxing gym with a bomb. So these four Deckers, that is Mateo, Rufus, Delilah, and Vince is the character, are all in the same location. And Vince detonates the bomb and kills a whole bunch of people, although Mateo, Rufus, and Delilah all miraculously survive. And this is a really interesting part of the story and something that kind of like leaves a lot of like feelings with me personally, because that one choice for these characters to go into that bookstore at that specific time could have very easily spelled out their death. They could have been in the wrong place at exactly the wrong time, and yet they both survive, and yet they both make it out all right. Mateo and Rufus manage to escape death two times before they both die for real. And these two instances are very explosive. I know that's a bad choice of words, almost cinematic in the sense that they're really big, dramatic uh, confrontations between people and things that like are almost unimaginable to have happened to them. The first time is this explosion that I just mentioned. And the second time is when Peck and his gang come to Mateo and Rufus and Peck pulls a gun on Rufus and both times they managed to escape and I think and kind of what I said was like a cosmic joke so after this encounter in the nightclub where Peck and his gang confront Rufus 
is when they decide to run out of the club, Peck and his gang have been arrested, and they decide to go to Mateo's apartment one last time before going to see his father. So Mateo and Rufus are in this apartment and everything is fine. They're having a good time. They even take a nap together. It's very cute. So in an act of kindness, because Mateo is absolutely the most kindest person that you'll ever read about in a book. He is just pure goodness, joy, happiness. He is benevolent in all ways you can imagine. Mateo decides that he wants to do something nice for him and Rufus, so he decides that he is going to go into the kitchen and make some tea. Now at the beginning of the book, and they really Chekhov's gun us as the readers, um, at the beginning of the book, Mateo says that his stove is broken and he leaves a note for his neighbor that was supposed to fix it that, hey, you, won't, you don't need to do that anymore because I'm gonna die today. So it, it's fine, don't worry about the stove, it's okay. But because Mateo left that note, the neighbor never came to fix the stove. And Mateo, because he wanted to do something nice for Rufus, who is his new friend, he decides that he's going to make tea and he forgets that the stove is broken. So when he goes to turn it on, the entire apartment goes up in flames and he dies. And I think having Mateo die in this way is an excellent examination of our expectations as the reader because when he presents us with them escaping an explosion, escaping a shootout, potential shootout at a nightclub, you think that whatever happens to them is going to be this massive event, something crazy, like dramatic and all this stuff. But really it's just something as simple as that, simple as forgetting that your stove is broken. Something as simple as crossing the street without looking both ways. Something as simple as making a mistake. Honestly, something as simple as being in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's a brilliant examination of how death can strike when we least expect it. It can happen in the place that we're supposed to be safe. It can happen in these major events. It's just unpredictable. Honestly, it's a little hard to try and speak intellectually about death because there's really nothing intellectual about it. Anything that I want to say about it has been said a million times. Um, but what I do want to say is that I think there's a theme throughout this book about living life to the fullest. That in a world where you will know when your last day of life is going to be, there's so many different perspectives that we get of these people having regrets of not living their lives, of not doing enough or doing the wrong things. And I think it's interesting because in this world, everyone to some degree knows that they're going to get that call eventually. They know that they're going to be on the other line with death cast. And yet, even so, you'll get people that will live life as if they're not going to get that call. And really what I leave this book with is something that is kind of taught to us on a much smaller scale, which is you can tell someone like certain life lessons. You can tell someone, don't make my mistakes. Don't do this. You should be better than me. But truly, and especially like, I think this is a common conversation between like parents and their children, but there are some mistakes that you won't learn from until you make them. You won't learn to live your life in the way that you want to until that life is threatened, until you realize that you're not getting another one, until you understand that this is the last one you'll have. So you can tell someone, live every day as if it's your last. Live your life, make sure that you are fulfilled by the time you are at death's door. But no one will do it until they realize that this life will end. Because the reality is, and there's nothing wrong with this, but so many of us live our life as if the future is guaranteed, as if we know we're going to wake up tomorrow, but that's not true. And even though in the back of our minds, with every breath we take, we know that we will eventually shake off this mortal coil and that the only thing that's guaranteed in life is death and taxes, even though we all know that, sometimes we just, can't make the right decisions. Sometimes we procrastinate. Sometimes we take two weeks to read a book that we know we could have finished in one. Sometimes we lay in bed for hours scrolling on TikTok even though we have things to do. Sometimes we make the wrong decisions. We spend too much time with the wrong people, spend too much time worrying about the wrong things. But the reality is that that will always happen. People will always make those mistakes. I don't think anyone has, you know, been at death's door that doesn't think at least one thing that they have regretted doing in their lifetime or one thing they regretted not doing in their lifetime. I think most people 
have regrets. There's always things that you could have done differently, things that you wish you hadn't done. I think really the goal should just be to make those regrets as little as possible. That when those regrets eventually come up in your mind and when you're focusing on them instead of other things, that we should just think about the things that we did accomplish, the things that we did manage to do in this life, all the good, all the people that we touched. Because also in this book, um, and minor trigger warning for uh, suicidal ideation, um, please skip to the next part if you don't want to listen. There's a portion in this book where Rufus and Mateo go visit it's a make a moment station where they essentially get to experience some kind of like adventure through virtual reality and they meet an employee that's working there and then a few chapters later we get a chapter from her perspective as she's standing on top of a roof she's thinking about jumping off when she sees rufus and mateo riding their bike together and she is moved by seeing these two boys living their life that she decides to get off of the roof so for all the different examinations about death and how we deal with our own mortality, there's also something to be said about the way that our lives touch other people and the decisions that we make that affect others in the good and the bad. And by seeing others live how it, oh, <laughs> ooh, this is where I crack. Okay, that's fun. Um, but I was just gonna say like how seeing others live can inspire us to live. Ooh, I didn't know that was gonna get me. I, I think like us as humans, we'll never really know how much we affect other people, especially like the positive impacts that we can have. I mean, these books, these things behind me have saved me in more ways than you can possibly imagine. They have impacted the way I see the world and the things that I want to do in my life. So yeah, I think a lot of people will read this book and leave thinking that we must live our lives to the fullest. We must, we must live every day as if it's going to be our last, as if that day we got the call from Deathcast. But I think we should also live knowing that the definition of living is different for other people. But definitely live trying to make at least one experience that you'll remember. What I really like about a lot of writers, and I think a lot of us hold this uh, same mentality, is there's this one like cute trend on TikTok that I've seen people do where it's like, if a writer loves you, then you'll never die. And it's this idea that you can be immortalized just by, you know, like writing or just leaving a lasting impact on the world. And sometimes people think that that impact is, you know, being a philanthropist, making donations, having like fame, fortune, or just doing something that's noteworthy to the whole world, right? We can just as easily immortalize ourselves in the connections we make with other people and the lives that we touch. So yeah, you know, live life to the fullest. Live life like you're going to get that call. Do things that you won't regret, but also live a life that will touch others. Make connections. Don't be alone. There are a lot of people that like solitude, including myself, but there's not a single person that can stand it. We are social creatures. No one can stand being alone forever and nor should anyone. Allowing human contact, allowing yourself to be vulnerable, be with someone, you know, love, hate, all those good emotions is good. Honestly, I can't make like a single coherent thought. There's just, there's so many things that I want to say and I just, I can't. Honestly, the most awful part of this book is just literally how it ends. Like, obviously I know what's going to happen, but so this is the last page and I have all of this left, right? And I think it's really a funny haha joke on the author's part because, and I recorded a TikTok of me saying this, but, and I didn't even say it intentionally. It was just like what came out in the moment. But as I finished the book, the only thing I could think of was, I thought I had more time. I thought I had more time to come to terms with them dying. I thought I had more time to hear from them and to hear their stories and their thoughts and then it was just over. And that's the reality of it. Sometimes it's just over. You don't get to hear the end of the story. You don't get to hear from people one last time. Sometimes it's just over. It's just the reality of it. There's so many things that are examined in this book about death and it's it's like too much for any one person to really comprehend every single nuance or intricacy that goes into this book truly um the only thing that i can say is that you just have to read it you just have to read it experience it 
cry with me cry with us the community we're a community i promise i will have more intellectual things to say in later videos but for this one i'm really going through the five stages of grief all at once like i i keep cycling like i'll I'm done with denial and then I'll go to anger. Then I'll go to depression. Then I'll go to anger again. Then I'll go to bargaining. I'm like, maybe because literally I was reading the book and I was like, as long as I don't finish it, they don't die. As long as I don't finish it, they don't die. It's fine. It's fine. But I'm like, no, I have to finish it. And I am going to continue with the series. Overall, I give it a five out of five. Literally, it's so good. It's awful. Um, it's a really good book. I think everyone should read it. <sighs> Coming to terms with our own mortality is something that not everyone can do. Not everyone will ever do. My favorite uh, thing that I like to say is actually a, qu a quote from Futurama, which is, thanks to denial, I'm immortal. But yeah, death is just one of those things that is always brought up in literature and media, and it's just something that no one will ever really be able to understand. Everyone will come to terms with it in their own way, um, but it's just one of those things. The thing we'll always talk about, we'll always dissect, discuss the different ways that people cope with it, approach it, deny it, and there will always be books like this that talk about it. The fascination is just because we have to understand that which we don't. It may be if we understand death, it'll give life meaning, but the only way that we can truly give our own lives meaning is by deciding when to take the leap, when to make a moment. Anyway, yeah, it's really hard to talk about my own mortality and death and things of this nature, the things that we don't understand. Um, I can't really have a good intellectual thought about it. My only goal for this video was not to cry and I kind of failed, but I did no tears slipped. So I call that a win. I think that's all I'm going to say for now. I, I really, I don't feel like I said a single intellectual thing about this whole book and I'm sorry. I think I could read this book a million times and read it over the course of two years and never fully process it and never fully come to terms with the slap in the face of reality that it gives me. All I can say is read the book. Uh, I have such a headache trying to understand. Be sure to support Adam Silvera on Instagram. Uh, this is supposed to be made into a movie of some kind later on, supposedly in 2024, but I don't know. We'll see. Support the cover artist. The cover art is really good. I, I really like this. I, I really enjoy this. No, I'm bending the page. I bent the page so irreversibly oh my god my luck it managed to land in a place where it's irreversibly damaged love that anyway cover art copyright 2017 by simon prades which i hope is how you say that be sure to support me on all my social media at listen to kristen on tiktok and instagram thank you for watching i'm so mentally drained i'm gonna go drown my sorrows in a wendy's four for four so Thanks. Forgive me. I forgot to do my little induction ceremony because this one is definitely going in my hall of fame. Ta-da! They both die at the end. Spoiler of the year. Ha ha ha. Funny. Ha ha ha. My chest feels hollow. Like genuinely. I just, I want to lay in a pit and rot.